welcome again, everyone. It's um, uh, welcome, Tilman. It's great to have you here. Thank you for making uh, time and, and and being available for this uh, for this uh, hour and so with um, with us at the Startup Grind. Uh, I remember from the chats before that no one is totally new to Startup Grind, so I'm not going to say what it is, except that it's an international network of uh, a community of startups and founders that really support uh, uh, entrepreneurship uh, through uh, a number of events. Normally, these events are physical, and now we are adjusting to the times and uh, and therefore uh, running a virtual fireside chats. Um, the community started 10 years ago in the Bay Area, and then it rapidly expanded to all over the world with around 600 chapters. Um, that uh, support the local uh, startup um, uh, community and ecosystem. And my name is Lorenzo. I'm uh, the co-director here at the Startup Grind, together with Elodie and, and David, uh, that were before in, on, on the screen. And uh, and here we have uh, a, a really cherished uh, uh, guest today, Tillman, the founder of uh, Yova Impact Investing. Um, and Tillman, uh, what 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 do you want to say just to introduce yourself <laughs> uh, well first of all thank you for for inviting me um appreciate it um and also for the for the for the... um i mean in terms of a short self-intro i mean what i can tell you is uh, i'm a techie by background so i'm actually a, a trained mathematician and computer science scientist so i spent a lot of my days uh, early in my career coding so I looked a lot into robotics, optimal control, machine learning, these kind of things. Um, but then after university, uh, switched to the dark side, which is the business side, if you will, um, away from coding. Uh, but I basically, like the red thread throughout my career is the intersection of technology and sustainability. I've always been a very green person. I've always been a very tech affine person. And um, I had a, like, I was working on a project in the first year of my career that made, made made me go so so much wow in terms of uh, the problem of climate change that i i actually took the decision to devote my career to to this problem um, and that's what i've been working on since then that was roughly 10 years ago uh, in a variety of roles and most recently and that means the last three and a half years or so as a founder of uh, of yoga and i guess we'll talk a bit more about that anyway so the the last thing i want to add in my self-introductions I, I live in zurich um with my wife and two small kids. Uh, so our smaller son is turning one on Christmas, our larger son is turning three on Christmas. And there's a running gag in our company that I timed. So they both were born one day apart from each other, just like with a two year gap and both right before Christmas and the running gag in our company is that I timed that. So, you know, my paternity leave would line up with Christmas time to uh, reduce the impact on the company. That's not true, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's definitely something or these two are something that even outside the startup world um, that are keeping me, let's say, keeping me busy and happy. Excellent. So where do you come from? Um, I'm originally from Mainz. That's a, a small town uh, uh, close to Frankfurt. It recently got very famous again uh, with this, its second biggest discovery, which is the, the vaccination from uh, uh, for, against COVID. So this company, BioNTech, that uh, discovered is based in Mainz. It's a city by the Rhine River. The first big discovery in Mainz was the uh, printable, the, the printing with removable letters by Johannes Gutenberg centuries ago. But like, if you're in, a, if you're from Mainz, then this is something that you're very, very aware of. Yeah. And and tell us a little bit about your early years. Uh, uh, how did you grow up? What, what what kind of kid were you? Oh, good question. Um, so I grew up in a, I would say, pretty average middle class family in Germany. My mom's a is a doctor. My dad was a management consultant. Um, and I have a larger brother. He's actually two years older than me. Um, he's a machine learning data scientist. He's the CTO of a of a startup in in, Ham in Hamburg uh, called Mindpeak. And uh, I have a younger sister. Uh, who lives in Frankfurt, both also have kids. So I think from a pretty like family uh, background or, or background that values family, what kind of a kid was I? Um, so when I was young, I think I had a pretty relaxed childhood because my brother was very ambitious. 
And like I very early had the feeling, you know, that I, there was no point in trying to keep up with him. And that may sound disillusioning, but it was actually very liberating because I think until today, I, I, I was always like, I, w I was able to try out a lot of stuff um, without uh, feeling a lot of pressure. Um, so I actually played a lot of music. Um, I've always been into sports, but I also played a lot of music and actually competitive music. So I played the piano also in competitions in my early years. And uh, music is still very important to me. Um, yeah, and I spent a lot of time in nature. My dad uh, was quite a, uh, when he was younger, before he had us, uh, he spent a lot of time in the mountains with his brother. So him and his brother took me and my siblings and my cousins to the mountains. So I actually went to the mountains quite a bit, despite not living in the mountains and spent a lot of time outside. Um, yeah, so, but I guess it was, uh, in the large sense, quite boring childhood, which is a great thing because there weren't any tragedies or big life-changing incidents. You're talking about values. What, what values did your parents uh, uh, transmit to you that you're still really leaving and, and attached to? Um, I think some of the values that my parents really cared about is uh, our curiosity. And, you know, the, the, like, I think knowledge and curiosity were really valued in, in our home. So, like, when I... When I wanted to explore new things uh, and do new things, there was always support, right? So there was never, um, if I wanted, you know, to join the chess club or go go on a specific kind of camp, or when I was 14 and I want, wanted to go to the United States for a year, uh, all of that was like immediately supported by my parents. So I think this 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 explorative nature of mine is also some is something that was is was valued in our home in our home and. Uh, uh, was very much supported, and that's still a big part of me today. I think the second thing that was really, or a second big value is just integrity. Like you, you stand up for what you do, and even you know if you mess up, and you will mess up, you take responsibility for that too. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing that is wrong is not taking responsibility. Um, but you know, this, this this sense of integrity, being honest, um, taking responsibility, I think is was was always very important. And then you said you studied mathematics. Yes. Uh, are there key learnings that you're still sort of using and leveraging on in, in what you do today? Key learnings. Um, and I don't refer to maybe sort of, sort of applications, but more in the, on the philosophical uh, perspective. Yeah. OK, that, that makes the question a lot easier. <laughs> so I mean, the, the funny thing, if you study math, at least with traditional math, uh, say like what mathematics mathematicians call pure mathematics, so non-applied mathematics. Um, uh, the funny thing about that is you, you you study it for years and you basically have zero applicable knowledge for real life, right? So you learn a lot of things that just don't really matter in real life. Um, but what really matters, and I think that for me, like why the why it was a great way to prepare for any kind of career that I would choose later, it's it really teaches you to think stuff through in a very creative way. So I think the big thing that it taught me was to really, you know, approach a problem that is just very fuzzy and complicated and you really have no idea to how even get your hands around it and to break that down into pieces very analytically and look for cues and, you know, come up with creative ways of putting the puzzle together of how can you solve this problem? And that I think is math is really good at teaching that. So it's more of a soft skill rather than, a piece of knowledge and that by the way that's also pretty much how i felt at the end of my studies throughout my studies i was actually preparing for a career in academia i i was already doing research in university in publishing research the only like real internship that i had done was in R, in, in the r d uh, department of, of idm and it was just that at the end of my, st of my studies i got in touch with the business world um, so i started working for sap which is close to heidelberg where i studied and actually realized that I really liked the business world, but I felt I had like literally no knowledge. Uh, I wasn't able to even, you know, read a P&L or a balance sheet or, and no clues about the business world. But one of my early realizations was that the, the thinking training that I had, you know, gotten over the five years of my university career was actually really, really valuable and enabled me to, you know, catch up for a lack of, say, base knowledge and business lingo that I didn't have. Uh, I've read somewhere uh, in an interview that you gave uh, some time ago that there was a time you, you worked at McKinsey for many years and you were working on a project 
that sort of uh, uh, triggers something in you and then you realize that you wanted to do something different. Um, can you tell us about that? It was, I think, it's developing a sustainability model. Yes, that's true. So there was, so I was with McKinsey for maybe six months at, at the time. And I was working, I was the analyst on a project uh, with six different clients. So it was in like large global clients. Um, the World Bank, Bank was one of them. There was a large NGO. Then there was a large reinsurance. There was a large energy company, but like really global companies. And the project was not very commercial. It was actually like more of a think tank kind of exercise. Um, what we were trying to do, we were trying to come up with scenarios for how will the world develop in the next 30 to 40 years? And what does that mean for climate and energy and the economy? Um, and it was a brilliant and awesome project uh, to work for because, you know, you had the chief economists of all these, these, uh, these companies, the chief researchers, the chief strategists, all coming together in like very, were in workshops in isolated areas in, in Switzerland, actually, uh, also in England. And, and, and I was part of these workshops. And my job was to build the analytical model that would do all the computations, you know, so they would tell me, uh, in this scenario, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam is in underwater in the year 2030 due to rising tides. Um, what does that mean for emissions and for global GDP? And then it would have been my job, you know, to compute that. Obviously not by myself, but with, um, um, with, with a small team. And that was an eye-opening experience. First of all, it was, I was just fascinated by the discussions. So they were like immensely smart people with a, quite a variety of... Um, of perspectives and the way that we're thinking about the world were just I had never you know thought about things so broadly and, and also so deeply um, but there were two things that really struck me the one was I was doing the math and uh, the outcome of, of the math was you know even in the most optimistic scenario this is a really 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 tough problem to figure out and like we're almost out of time and that was in 2010 it was 10 years ago yes it's a big problem and it will have immense um, uh, consequences and you know not not even you know just for people on the other side of the planet that will be bad enough but but for everyone or at least you know for everyone except the super rich it will dramatically change many many things and the math you know any kind of simulation I ran was telling me that um, and I was shocked but at the same time I was super intrigued because a lot of the things that you could do and that involved things you know like solar energy or renewable energy in general really fascinated me because it were fascinating technologies um, so the first realization was, wow, this is an awesome problem to work at because it's, it's so big, you cannot look away from it, but also there's fascinating aspects or solutions where we can take. So it was just, you know, something that had a, a strong gravitation to me. That was the first revelation. The second one was, I was doing the project, you know, with large corporations and I was very naive still at the time. I think I'm still a na naive person today, but the, the naive aspect of it is I was, really struck by the way they thought about this, you know, I mean, these were, um, what's, what's, what's a good way to put that? So the things at stake were typically things like, you know, were, were basically the structures of the status quo. That was, that was what's, what's at stake, you know, how can we protect shareholder value? How can we protect the influence, say, of the countries right now, the corporations right now? And I mean, obviously for me, I was a 25 year old or 26 year old, like, for me, that didn't really matter so much. It was about, you know, what does it mean for the stability of the society and, and, and the environment and, and, and all that, the planet and the people. And that was the first time I realized, okay, wow, actually McKinsey was for me a great place to work on the problems that I really care about because, you know, in, and probably in few other settings I could have worked with this kind of leverage and impact and insight. But at the same time, it was one of the first times I realized the agenda by which these you know, really, really successful people think doesn't at all add up with my agenda in the sense of, you know, what are the questions that we're trying to answer and what are the objectives that we're trying to achieve? And those two big revelations, like, let me, do, I mentioned it before my self-introduction to actually say at the end of that project, okay, well, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to work on. And the main question is, you know, how can I best work on this problem? What is the role? What is the path? But that's what I want to do. Is it that when you realized that you wanted to start your own business? No, no, that came later. Um, no, no. So, I mean, so for me, it was, I think I'm quite a pragmatic person. I'm not one of the founders. You know, you have these entrepreneurs that 
it's always been clear that they want to be entrepreneurs and it's maybe even the only thing that they can be because that's just the way they function and their mind works. Uh, for me, it was never clear that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was always, you know, maybe not even always, but like it started to be an option. But I never had these motivations. Uh, I, I want to be my own boss or, um, you know, I have that exact vision and the only way to go for it is if I do everything by myself. Um, I didn't have that Certainly not back then. I was, you know, I was straight out of university. I had, had no, say, real understanding of the business world. I was just, you know, exploring and, and playing. I had no real clue about my role. Um, so that came later. I was quite pragmatic always, you know, what are the things that I want to work on and what's the best place for me to really, like, do meaningful work on them. So McKinsey was actually a really good place for me for, for quite a number of years. I really liked working there. Uh, but it was always also clear that there's a, you know, a timestamp for me um, there for the simple fact that, say, a leadership role at McKinsey, being a partner at McKinsey was not that intriguing for me. Uh, whereas working on individual projects uh, was very intriguing to me. Um, but so it was clear that I would have to leave at some point. What had happened by then was that by the time I left, I had grown a lot of confidence in the sense, you know, that, you know, my lack of a business education actually doesn't hold me back in the business world. Uh, and also that I had, I had grown the confidence to say that I think I know what the right questions to ask are. And that's both on, you know, on, a, on the general level, you know, what, what, what's a good business idea or what is a business idea that I can um, grow excited for, but then also more on a management level. How do we now solve particular problems? So then, you know, at some point I simply said, okay, if I want to work on sustainability, if I want to work on climate change, Actually, now, you know, with uh, how old was I when, when, when I left McKinsey, I was 33. Um, now I think the best next step for me is to, to do this, you know, in a self-led way as an entrepreneur. Um, simply because I felt like there's no corporation that I can work for where the agenda is right. With, I'm, I'm, I've always been a big fan of a number of NGOs, but I think my skill set wouldn't, wouldn't be right for some of them. NGO actually still still very, very relevant career path for me. And I think actually in terms of, of uh, impact, I still think policy, policy making or politics is super, super impactful, but it's quite clear to me that that's, you know, way outside my skill set. I'm way too impatient and I'm not, I'm not a very diplomatic person. So that it was always quite clear that that's not a valid career path for me anyway. And so we come to Yova. What yes. is Yova? What, is, what is Yova? What is Yova? So YOVA stands for your values. That's, that's where the name comes from. Um, and YOVA is a company that was actually created with the intention to promote a better world through investing. And it, it's based on a couple of core beliefs. So like I had a couple of recurring learnings uh, and I've been mentioning some of them already, um, but a couple of recurring learnings throughout my career. And one of them was, I really don't like finance. And I don't like the industry. I don't like the topic. Um, and the number, you know, just because one of my early projects at McKinsey was actually in a bank and I found it super irritating that, you know, the product is money and you only talk about money and I don't know, it just it felt very, very uninspiring. And then also the, just as a consumer, also when I started having a salary, you know, all of a sudden my bank became interested in me and wanted to, you know, give me advice and stuff like that. And remember, I was a nerd, a mathematician. So when they promoted something to me, proposed something to me, I would actually do the math and not even in Excel. You know, I would write a program in C++ to do simulations. And I could never get my heads around it. I was always like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody with my interest in mind offer this to me? So I was always very frustrated with finance. Um, so I always like, I also took a decision at some point in my career to, you know, never get involved with finance before I turn into a professional asset manager. No, because what, what happened eventually is that I grew a large appreciation for the importance of the financial system for societal progress in general, but especially for the sustainability transition. So it had become clear to me that there is no way to make the world more sustainable if we don't get the finance system on board. And you know, prior to, prior to Yoga, I had worked a lot in renewable energies, in, in, in mobility, in, in sharing, um, technology, these kind of things. And it seemed to me, while of course we're not where we need to be in the energy sector and in the mobility sector, but there was a lot of stuff happening there. But if you look at finance, 
oh my God. I mean, still today, I mean, it's a big topic now, but still today, a lot of it is, is very, very empty promises. And I'm very relieved that regulators are stepping in now to, to, to put an end to that. But so, you know, just this realization of, first of all, finance is super important. Second of all, finance is not taking responsibility you know, uh, for societal and environmental issues. And then thirdly, I did grow, uh, grow the realization that my skill set is actually very well suited for finance. Yeah, so because you know I, I am good with numbers, I am good with abstract thinking, I am good with with software, for example, much more than with hardware. That's why I never. So that's why I think you know renewable energy or these more hardware-driven topics would have been more difficult for me. So that combination of realizations just led to the fact that okay, maybe it's time to actually move into finance and impact investing seemed like a great thing to do. So that's how we started Yoba. And Yoba is the intent to really shape how finance is thought and how investment is done. And the, the way we think it should be done is that society, so, you know, everything you do in life, anything, you know, from getting a loaf of bread at the local bakery to having a, a chat with friends has some sort of consequence for the world. And that's just the way it is. Um, but the problem is a lot of these things have costs that are not factored in. That's what economists call an externality. And um, these are very, very present in the financial system where just nobody, like these costs, these risks are not factored in. So we want to, we want to redesign the financial, system, uh, the financial system in a way um, that sustainability costs are taken into account. And if you do that, the financial system looks dramatically different. And in many ways, it looks a lot better for the people. So this was a very technical explanation of what we're doing. But basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it easy for people to take responsibility. I mentioned before, you know, how that something I care about a lot is taking responsibility. That doesn't need to be something painful. It can actually be something very uplifting and inspiring. It's just that it's so difficult. We want, in many in ways, we want to make it easy for you to take responsibility for your life. So we've designed a solution where you can invest money for your future without compromising returns, you get, you know, you have the same return expectation as you would have in any kind of decent, serious um, uh, professional investment offering, but you take care of your values, you take care of sustainability concerns because the, the investment is also designed to make the world a better place. The planet, the people, and whether that means biodiversity or CO2 emissions or education or gender equality, um, or, or human rights, you get to decide that. And that's what Yoba is. How did you get started with Yoba? What were your first steps? Um, so our first step, so, so what I did is I left McKinsey without a clear idea in mind of what I wanted to do. The Yoba idea was not born. It, was, it had become clear to me, you know, that I need to do something more entrepreneurial. Um, and I was experimenting with different ideas. Um, and having a lot of, say, explorative discussions. And um, I was having lunch with one of my co-founders now. He wasn't a co-founder back then. Um, he was actually a hedge fund manager, and we were discussing you know, a lot of the topics that I just described. And then he basically told me, well, we had this, something that I do for my parents and my parents-in-laws. I manage their money in this way, you know, where I provide them with portfolios of stocks that makes sense to them, but they're financially optimized, but they can see each company they invest in. And, you know, I choose the ones they really like. So his father, for example, he really liked classical music. So he gave him the stock of Steinway, which made, you know, the, the concert pianos. And his father was delighted. And he told me that and I was like, okay, that, you know, I, I would like that. It's, you know, it's transparent. I can, you know, make sure the sustainability works out. Um, so I got excited. Um, and Actually, the next week we sat down again and basically fleshed out the idea over, you know, red wine and cheese um, uh, and a flip chart. How would that product work? And the next thing they did, I, I called up my now the, the next co-founder, Eric, um, who was in a similar stage as me. He was just he had also left McKinsey. He was also trying out different businesses. And in contrast to my business ideas, his business ideas were actually working, but uh, he wasn't overly excited by them anyway. So. We had lunch, I told him about the idea, and we decided, okay, let's give it a shot. So the first thing we did is we designed a small brochure that would, you know, sh that basically would explain the offering um, in PowerPoint. It was still very close to McKinsey Times. Um, we printed it out, and then we went around uh, Zurich through cafes. So especially right here at Limmatplatz, Café Lang, we would walk around desks, tell people, hey, do you have a minute? Can you take a look at this? What do you think about this? 
And then people were really interested. So what happened is like people were, ah, does this exist? Like, how does it work? And we said, yeah, we don't really know how it works. We're trying to think whether it's interesting. And, but we, we got a lot of positive feedback in the sense that people were saying, okay, if you do this, please let me know. I would, you know, I would love to try this out. Um, and that gave us the feeling, okay, there might be a market. Let's try to build a prototype. So then we tried to find a person that was willing to actually put money into this and provide them with a, with a sustainability portfolio, which is now, you know, the standard Yoba portfolio. Obviously not with technology. There was still a lot of manual work. We described the portfolio in a PDF, showed it to the person. The person said, okay, yeah, you know, I'll put in 10,000 francs. Um, just tell me where I need to transfer the money. That worked, and that's how we basically then stumbled forward bit by bit. We had two or three customers before we even you know, had taken a formal decision to go forward with this. But then we said, okay, let's actually incorporate a company and see whether we can get funding to actually you know, build a, a real prototype, you know, in the sense that we have technology that does parts of this. So we were able to get some investors on board. We hired our first two employees who are still with us today. Um, and you know, we built the first prototype. Then we said, okay, maybe we can actually automate this. Maybe we can actually do it this way. And that's basically the mode that we're still in today where we think, okay, well, until now it actually worked. Let's see if we can, you know, take that next step. And then that's, that's how it started. Did you follow the prescriptions of uh, a lean startup, uh, a mom test in doing early customer research? Yes, religiously. And I'm not joking. So like we often, got called out. I mean, again, that's the nerds in, in, in us. So Eric too, uh, my, my co-founder, he's, he's an engineer. Um, so I'm the mathematician, but he's like, he's, he's a lot sharper than me and, 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 and a lot sharper than me in his thinking. No, but like, we're like, we, we were fascinated by this model and I think we really played it by the book. So we had, you know, we formulated all our, our hypothesis, came up with ways to test them um, in a very MVP driven logic, always along the build measure learn cycle. So, you know, design an experiment to eradicate your biggest uncertainty, get some data, think about what that means for the future, improve the prototype. And uh, that's basically the model that we're still in. And it's, I think it has served as well. There are still very big uncertainties that we haven't been able to resolve, right? So that uh, I think only time can resolve them. Um, yeah, but like any, anybody, at least in the software um, uh, business, also in the hardware business, you know, trying to start a new startup, a new idea, lean UX, lean startup um, makes sense. They have their limitations. You cannot A-B test everything. That's especially true in marketing. And especially, you know, if you have a, a, an idea that really changes the world, you have to also mix a lot of conviction in because otherwise, you know, you, you'll never get off the ground. But if you have a good mix of conviction and a very analytical experiment-based approach, um, then I think that can work very well. When is it you realize that you were onto something, that you got the sort of a positive response that, that, that showed that there was really a market for this? Um, so I think the first time we realized that was when we were walking around the cafes, what I, what I uh, described before, you know, that like people were excited, like people we didn't know were excited, gave us their email addresses and said, let us know when, once you offer this. Um, then there was a time where we thought, okay, maybe we're wrong. When we were trying to get financing, we, we, we found a supporter very early. So like a, a business angel, a woman that believed in, in us and the idea pretty quickly and gave us some start capital. But after we found her, it took us a long time to get the next investors because then, you know, especially every, all the business angels we met that were into finance said, no, you know, digital wealth management, it's, it's been tried, it doesn't work. And remember this was 2017, so everybody was asking, where, where's the crypto in it, right? Why do you not do crypto? When is your ICO? So then, you know, there was a whole time where we were thinking, okay, maybe, you know, this first test was right, but um, maybe we're actually not onto something. And, you know, that's always the question. If you have the feeling you're onto something, then you're thinking, okay, am I really, am I really? Uh, but I mean, then, you know, at a certain point in time, we just, as soon as we started to do it in a more public way, where we actually, you know, pushing the brand publicly. We were applying for say awards, trying to get some visibility, just the feedback that we got. Um, we felt like we're, we were onto something. And very clearly also, again, you know, the conviction that, that I mentioned, just that we felt, okay, there's so much buzz that we are able to create. People are so excited that even if the product that we have right now is not working, 
I think we're onto something with this this idea and also you know the values that we stand for. We can make this work, um, even if it's not what we're doing right now. We can make this work. The, the, the whole idea, the spectrum of ideas that we have, we can make something work around that. And where do you stand now? And what is the next on your roadmap? Um, so now the, we launched the platform um, a bit than less than two years ago. So around uh, just after Christmas, two thousand eighteen. Um, and we're now at a stage where we could reach profitability if we want it next year. Uh, but that would require us to stop investing in growth. Uh, and actually our plan is to, to really scale up now. So actually we're now raising more capital because we want to uh, keep scaling up in Switzerland, but now also, and that is our biggest pro uh, project to date, enter the German market um, uh, in the next year. And that's a big step because there's a whole lot of regulation involved, <laughs> much, much more than in Switzerland. Um, so that's, that's a project that we've been working on since, since the beginning of this year. That's the big next step. How did you navigate the, um, the hard times of COVID? Sorry, the hard times of what? COVID, Corona. Ah, COVID. Um, wait and see. Um, so, I mean, what something we did very early, I mean, we like, I mean, there, there are a couple of dimensions there, right? So in terms of health of our employees, I think we're just, you know, trying to do what makes sense. And we're looking, we're in discussions with other startups, with, with other companies. Um, and obviously we look at the guide, guidelines by BAG. In the first wave, we actually uh, implemented them quite normally. Now we're way ahead of BAG because we're feeling like BAG may be a bit too, too relaxed about things. Um, but that's, you know, just the workplace level in terms of, the strategy, um, we did one larger change. So there was, I mean, as for many online businesses, we immediately had a boost from, from COVID. Yeah? So if you're not in travel or in mobility, there were a couple of industries that, you know, that benefited from the crisis. And I think we were one of those or we were in one of those industries. But that was just the beginning uh, part. Then in summer, things cooled down a bit. And there, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty now. And there has been since, you know, I mean, in the beginning, everybody thought, okay, this, is, this will be over in two or three months, but then maybe May, June, people started to realize this may be around for two or three years. Um, so one thing that we did is actually we changed our, our planning for this year, so 2020, uh, at the end of the second quarter, and said, okay, we'll put a lot more focus on product development and a lot less focus on marketing. I mean, we always like, I mean, for us, it's 80, 90% product and 10 to 20% marketing. Uh, but just in terms of, you know, management time and, and budget, we wanted to say, okay, this year, nobody knows what's happening anyway. We don't know if it's a good year to invest in marketing. Let's invest in the product because our growth model is a product led growth model anyway. Right. So we want to have customers that are really excited by the product and, and thereby, you know, tell their friends and that works quite well. And that is the core of our model. So our growth model is product led. We want to make the product brilliant and awesome and just that that people really, really love it. And the marketing comes around that. The marketing is, is an accelerator that, that complements things. And that's a strategy that we really doubled down on in context of the COVID crisis. And I think that was probably the, the one large response. Apart from that, we just, we just keep going. I read an interview uh, where you say, uh, quote, without having experienced the financial crisis, you are not really grown up. What do you mean? And what, how does it apply to <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, there was this this week uh, at the end of February where the stock markets really crashed, right? Um, and we, we started Yoba in 2017. And since the beginning, I mean, already, I mean, even in 2014, 2015, people said, no, but you know, we're at the end of this economic cycle and the stock markets will crash soon. Don't invest your money. And, um, but you know, then there's always this research that tells you, it's impossible to time the market, but a lot of people were saying that. 2017, that was even more the case. We got a lot of the advice, don't start an investment company now. The markets are about to crash. Nobody will in invest. So we've always been presented with this question, what do you do when the markets crash? So in February, they crashed and they crashed quite strongly. Yeah? So the, I mean, there was panic at the stock markets like that even, you know, was 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 more drastic than, than after the Lehman collapse. It was really, really, really big panic. 
And for us, this was kind of a relief. You know, when you, when you, when you know that you, everybody is talking that this, this bad thing is coming for you, it's finally there. You can now, you can, there, the beast is there, you can finally fight it, right? So, I mean, we're obviously very alert, but uh, there was the sense, okay, now we'll actually find out what this means for us. Uh, and we can, we always tell, said, okay, no, we, we, we think we're ready for it. Now we can prove our worth. And we have this thing at the end of each week, we have what is called um, the end of week WhatsApp. We have a WhatsApp group with all of our employees and our investors and some stakeholders. And we have this end of week WhatsApp where we just summarize the week. And I remember at, that, at the end of that week, um, I started the end of week WhatsApp with uh, the saying, um, you aren't really, you haven't really lived if you've never had your heart broken and you're not a real asset manager if you haven't steered through a crisis, right? So this is, this may be painful right now, but it's good. It's good that we do this and it's, it's, it's a, it'll be an experience that we'll, that we'll cherish. And that's also the way that we see it right now because luckily, I mean, we, we, were, we were able to prove our worth and we managed uh, and steered through the crisis very well. But that's what I meant with this quote. Was it, was it the toughest uh, challenge that you faced? No, no. Um, I mean, that's easily said, easily said now in hindsight, but uh, no, there were definitely tougher challenges than that. That challenge, it didn't turn out so tough for the simple reason. I mean, it's the, it's the way that we, it's, it's based in our investment philosophy, right? So we're not an asset manager that, that is constantly on the lookout for optimizing investments in the market. We're not an active, uh, so our investment strategies are not what is called active. There is no... So we, we don't say, you know, Tesla is overpriced right now, we sell it now, or, or SMI is underpriced, we'll, we'll, we'll buy that. We have a passive investment philosophy, and that's just based on science. Again, that's the nerd in us. So we, you know, we're in constant uh, exchange with, with the experts at ETH, University of Zurich, University of Hamburg. Those are our three, three biggest thought, thought sparing partners. Um, and that's how we designed the, the process, just passive investment, where you want to develop with the market where you just know there will be a crisis. And when there is a crisis, you'll take a strong hit, but it's okay because you have a long-term investment horizon. And so your, your investment can recover. So we were quite, you know, it was clear to us, there's nothing we can do right now, but just sit it out and wait. And if this crisis is at least remotely similar to any of the crisis, financial crises in the past 100 years, things will work themselves out. Um, so we had, a lot of reason, let's say, to, to have confidence in that. There were other crises in the company where it was you know, very unclear what is the right course of action. But in this, this one, it was quite clear what the right course of action was. So what was the toughest uh, challenge that you faced? Um, so I can, I can remember two. One was more, so one was really tough for me emotionally. There, there was a time briefly before our seed financing where you know, cash just got really, <laughs> really, really thin. Uh, so our, we were about to run out of cash. We really we needed new money, um, and we had good investors lined up. But you know, getting a financing round together is just a lot of work, and it all needs to work out on the exact date. And everybody needs to agree on a lot of complicated things. And back then, I was very, very worried. You know, that we wouldn't 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 be able to pull it off, or that some people would change their mind, and we would have to tell you know employees that will have difficulties paying their salaries. And that, that's something in hindsight, it all worked out, you know, so you're not worried about that. And we, do, we didn't even, it even worked as planned. Um, but given that I was doing this for the first time, I was very, very stressed out. For me, that personally, you no, know, that was a, probably the only time in the history of the company where, you know, I had trouble sleeping. I was very worried about what it would mean for our team um, and, and all that. And then there were, I mean, not a crisis, but we had a couple of tough instances. We, we did two, I think one of the things we like really, are proud of and we did really well was built the team that we have um, so we have an awesome team and it's it's part of why i love coming you know to 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 work every day so much um, but we did two very painful hiring mistakes and they were painful um, on, on 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 a number of, of dimensions and they weren't crises because they weren't existential or anything but they really really made us you know sit back and think okay wow this was painful for everyone involved even for you know the the people that were hired or maybe especially for them um how can we make sure you know that we, we get on topic on top of topics like this yeah. what is it didn't work out uh, if you can tell us more um yeah so i mean the 
so we once had a person, so we hired a person that um, for a position that we found was really, really important, uh, but that we didn't really understand because we as founders had never, we didn't have experience in the field. And we brought, uh, and we hired a, a person and, you know, we were, it was, I think we were just too confident that we had assessed the skill set probably. Um, when the person came aboard, we had more the feeling that she was, uh, this person was very, say, charming and, and good at presenting themselves, but it was very difficult. The person didn't deliver. Let me let me put it like this. But we were already very emotionally invested. We had built strong bonds, and you know, and then we were, you know, a sustainability startup with a very positive spirit. And it was the first time we just had to get around, you know, to taking the tough call. Okay, this is not working out, and. And, you know, you may not be on board with it, so it just means that we need to fire you. So that's also, you know, a, a part of growing up as, as a company. Um, but it, it was difficult. It was very early in the history of the company. We weren't properly financed yet, so that, and then we had to, you know, we also, we also didn't have proper working contracts. Yeah? So we didn't have, a, have an agreement for this kind of case. So the person was able, you know, to force us to pay a lot of uh, salaries that uh, the person didn't even work for that was still coming out of, or like the very early money that we had, which wasn't a lot. So it did feel like an, uh, a bit more existential than it maybe was. And that was just very painful. And I mean, like, and I think, it, I mean, the upside is uh, it really made us appreciate the importance of hiring, but in general, the importance of how you want to interact with the people on your team, how much, you know, uh, uh, how much to trust to put in, the, uh, in them and to make sure that this trust is well-founded. And do that in a in a in a two sided way, right? So also that they know that they can really put trust in you. But so I mean, the feedback that we get now is that our hiring process is is long and intense. Um, but I think out of the so we've hired more than fifty people by now. We are about thirty now. That includes you know the the interns that that leave again after a time. And we've made these two mistakes. And uh, with with the rest of the team, like we've had. People where we, we are, like I was talking about the two first employees that are still with us today. I mean, that's that's uh, our lead engineers, Lenka and, and Sergi. And there's not a day where I'm not happy about this decision. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Samuel who's asking, what was your biggest error at the Yoga? And what would you like to change if you, go, uh, if you, go, if you could go back? That's, would you say that this is the answer? Um... Our biggest mistake. I mean, so we made a lot of mistakes that I would do differently right now. But I mean, we had, um, as it is with life, you know, I don't think at the time we took the right decision. We just didn't know any better. So it's nothing where I say, you know, I can, I mean, it may sound like a cliche, but I think these were important mistakes to, to, to make. You were talking about Lean Startup and Lean UX. Um, it's not easy to, to design frameworks and processes that, that make these things work. Um, and we had to learn that. Yeah. So, I mean, if we started again now, I would start with the process that we have now. But, I mean, that's a very theoretical question. Um, I don't think there are big things that, that we would do different. I think one thing, something that I learned from my co-founder, and I wish I had learned that earlier. <clears throat> so my co-founder, Eric, he's very much into wholesomeness and, and um, how do you say, um, I forget the English word. So he's, I mean, he, he meditates three hours a day. He's really into, into mindfulness. That was the word I was looking for. And in general, you know, a very wholesome um, um, lifestyle uh, based on kindness towards everyone, including yourself. And the way that, and I wasn't, right? So, I, I mean, I had a lot of appreciation. I was also meditating, but I was meditating maybe 10 minutes a day. So I have appreciation for the topic, but not zero wisdom. Yeah? <laughs> zero, say, like a deep, deep foundation in that. Um, it's a bit better now, but that was the case four years ago. Um, so I was very much in the mindset, you know, we have to build this company now and it'll be a lot of work, but that's okay. We'll be happy later. And Eric was always in the mindset, um, you know, if, if we're not happy right now, then this whole thing is not, not worth it, right? It, it can't be something, so, or like he would say, I'm not willing, you know, to just, you know, have miserable five years in the hope of, you know, them being successful at, at changing the world. And that, um, that's something I had to learn. I mean, you know, I, can, I, I had spent six years at McKinsey. McKinsey doesn't 
like many say large corporations doesn't have it as a priority to be happy short term it's a lot of you know we're trying to get there and once we're there we'll we'll relax and be happy and i was i think i had really bought into that that mindset and i think learning that you know learning to prioritize happiness and 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 being settled in in the moment um I think that was an extremely valuable <laughs> lesson for me, not only for my, obviously for my happiness, uh, but also for the success of the company. I've, I don't think we could, I could have kept, you know, going at the speed that we have if, if I had stayed in the mode that I was in uh, four years ago. We have another question from Yatin. Uh, what would you say makes your products so unique and lovable by the consumers? Mm -hmm. So when we, so, I mean, what, what is really good about our product is that it's, I think it's impossible in, in 98% of the world um, to invest money with that good sustainability impact and at that level of transparency. When I say 28, 98%, I'm saying that because there's two companies in the United States that are at a similar level, but there's nobody in Europe, for example. So what is unique at Yova is that you can invest money, you get a financial return, but you also get, get a really good sustainability impact. Now, that's something that, you know, is rather technical. What makes, if, if investors ask me, um, what is good about Yova? What is the secret sauce? What, what makes it work? Usually the way I, I describe it is what we're good at, uh, what, what we are good at is emotionalizing investing. So, you know, investing is very abstract and technical. It's, you know, not something that most people enjoy thinking about, but we are able to fill it with life. It's some, all of a sudden it has something to do with your values, with your world. If you have kids, it may actually be super relevant because, you know, you save money for them. You don't want that money that your kids, that should set up your kids for, you know, the time in 20 years from now, you don't want that money to burn the world in the meantime. Um, so it's becoming very real, very emotional, something very meaningful. Um, and I think that is what you, what's unique about it. If you create a portfolio with Yova, you know, you can really tell uh, us about the topics that you care about. Um, do I want to invest in a vegetarian portfolio or not? You can actually play around with that. If I, if I go for veg or non veggie, what does that change? You can see each individual company. We do things like um, just last night, we had a webinar where our customers uh, can talk to the CFO of, of one of the companies that we invested in. Last night, we did that with Timinos. A couple of months back, we did that with the CEO of Niebe, which is a producer of, um, um, of um, low carbon heating and cooling technologies. So it all of a sudden has really something to do with your life. It creates excitement. Um, and I think that that's what makes it lovable. Um, people are not used uh, from their financial products to be to make sense to them. All right. I mean, when it was the first time that you actually I mean, you need to really understand or study this stuff to, to understand how a bank account works and what where, where is even the money on your bank account? People don't know, right? And with Yoga, you know where the money is and you know why it is there. And it makes sense. And this kind of, it's really empowering and uplifting, especially because the answer to the question, where is the money is, is a good one, right? It's, it's where you want it to be. It creates, it sets you up for the future financially, but it's also in line with what you care about with your values. And that's what makes it lovable. Okay, apparently you, you uh, just acquired a new customer. I think you made a right after I'm happy to hear that. Very good. Uh, well, uh, we want to clarify this point. She said, oh, he is sorry. Uh, if you're investing 98%, how do you call your admin and startup costs? Maybe, no, that's the 98% is that's, uh, investing uh, a world, uh, and uh, the OVA is in the 2% and actually all that is the combination of sustainability and returns, correct? Yes. So, what I meant is, yeah, and like, it's very difficult in the world to invest money for sustainability impact, unless you're a millionaire, right? So if you're a millionaire, you can go to a private banker and they can make stuff work for you. Not many can, but some can. There are very good, actually very good private banks in Switzerland with regard to uh, sustainability. Just think about Globe Balance, for example. But you need to be very wealthy in order to get access to that service. So what I meant is, you know, if you're part of the 99%, maybe rather than the 98%, uh, you're basically st stuck with your wife, <laughs> if you will. Uh, I like to think it's not a bad place or a bad thing to be stuck with. Um, but let me answer anyway the question, how do we cover our cost? Um, so we charge um, a management fee for the money that you invest. So if you invest, say, 10,000 francs, um, we charge a percentage. Uh, and the percentage depends on how much you invest. The more you invest, the lower the percentage. 
So it's uh, between 0.6% and 1.2% of the sum. So for example, for 10,000 francs, it would be 1.2%. Um, so it's 120 francs that you pay us to, to manage your money every day. Um, uh, and you pay us that per year. So it's 10 francs, 10 francs a month, if you will. And that covers all the costs. It's, and by the way, that's one of the things that, funnily enough, in finance is revolutionary because that's the only thing you'll ever pay. It's an all-inclusive fee. It's fully transparent. There's nothing else you'll pay. Because typically what happens is that you also have transaction costs. You have product costs. Often enough, you have, you know, what is called in German an Ausgabeaufschlag, uh, where you have to pay, you know, to even buy in. Then often you have to pay again if you want your money back. For us, these 10 francs a month is the only thing you'll ever pay. Um, and since it's a percentage of your invested amount, if your investment grows, then we also, you know, we make a bit more money because then it's 1.2% of a larger piece of the pie. Um, and if we do a bad job or the stock markets are bad, then we also make less money. So it's, it's a fairly structured deal. And that's, that's how we pay. That's, that's our revenue. Great speech. And, uh, we touched lightly before on team and, um, um, I'd like to ask you, uh, what kind of people you hire? What are you looking for when you hire some, some new person, more attitude, more skills or what else? Well, yes, <laughs> those two do matter. So we have, um, we have four dimensions that we look for, uh, will skill results, sorry, will values results and skill. So will is basically, you know, your whole attitude to learning, to exploring. So we, we, we look for curiosity. We look for a person. So are you somebody that wants to learn new things that wants to explore? We're looking for perseverance. Are you somebody, you know, who can keep going when things get tough? That doesn't, you know, just run for the next interesting thing. And so those are all the will dimensions. That's basically your, your, your general approach to work, your work ethics, uh, your professionalism, your, your drive uh, for achievements. Um, the second dimension is values. Yeah, so you do need to be a credible sustainability fighter. You know, so if, you, um, if you're not on board with a vision and we don't believe that you're on board with a vision, then you wouldn't enjoy with us being, being with us anyway. But it's also, you know, for, uh, in the values um, dimension, it's also uh, startup life. So, so are you somebody that can cope with rapid changes with experimentation? So are you somebody, you know, who gets excited by an idea, tries to implement it, then the data shows that it was a bad idea and then who can let go of that, that idea? Or are you somebody who's so attached to their ideas that that's difficult for them? So that's values. Those are the two most important dimensions. Then results are things like analytical thinking, conceptual thinking, can you break down a problem? And then the least, uh, actually the least important dimension, which doesn't mean that it's not important, but it's the least important are skills. So say if you're working in marketing, what are your exact marketing skills? Um, or if you're coding, which, which programming languages can you code in? What, what exactly have you done? And the reason why that is the least important one is, is that um, we think that requires updating every three to five years anyway. Um, and we can change that. So we've, we have hired people that were awesome um, in, you know, in, in their wills, in, in their values. And they're also were just re very smart. So also in the results dimension, very, very good. But for example, that they had never coded in the tech stack that we need, but then we just taught them and now they're brilliant engineers. Um, so that's what we look for. So you also hire people that haven't done it before. Sorry? You also hire people who haven't done it before. If it's a specific, uh, um, a skill or. Yes. I mean, so it does depend a bit on, on the position. So if you want to be our CIO, then you should have invested some money before. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, look, Everything we do, we've also haven't done this before. Like, I'm, this is the first company. Uh, I mentioned before that, you know, a year before becoming an asset manager, I was still under the motto, I never want to work in finance. So doing something for the first time is something that we find very normal. What we care about is that you have the will and the values, you know, to make it work. And then also the, you know, the, the, let's say the, the intrinsics, the smartness, the, the hunger, the appetite. Um, talking about team, I remember you posted recently about your retreat in the mountains strategy meeting. What was the biggest outcome of that meeting? If you can the share outcome of that meeting, if it's not confidential. Yeah, that's exactly why. What 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 can I say? So I mean, what what we did there? 
I mean, so we do these kind of sessions usually about once a quarter is where we, you know, we take in the beginning was the founders. Now it's the founders and, you know, our most important advisors, so the people in our board. Um, and we usually go off site and just, you know, bury our heads in, in a hut and also spend some quality time. So these, these, these retreats are also for reconnecting, you know, what, why are, we do it. We have this, this, this routine that we do, which is called, why are you really here? If you're curious about that, I can talk about it later, but in terms of the strategy, what was the biggest outcome? So what we did this time, it was really putting up together the exact plan for next year. You know, so we had the rough idea. Okay. We want to go to the German market. Uh, we had already founded our daughter company in Berlin. Um, but now how does it work exactly? You know, how many people need to be in Berlin and how do we actually structure the work between Zurich and Berlin? So one of the decisions is that, for example, um, all the critical systems, all the critical technology will still be developed in, in Zurich. So we'll also have um, um, developers in, in Berlin, but all the critical systems, all the intelligence will be here where the, where the headquarters is. But it's more of these, you know, it was a very, say, operational um, um, uh, session in the sense that it was the operational strategy or the execution strategy. How do we make it work? Then, you know, at the last strategy, it was much more, Again, starting with the whiteboard and post-its, uh, we asked the questions like, you know, if we had endless budget and could manage any kind of complexity, what are the things that we would do right now? Yeah, and then we would, I don't know, we would partner up with Google to build this and this and show in every Google search that and that, these kind of things. That's where, that's how we strategize. Do you have a mentor with a company new in your journey? I have many mentors. I don't think I have this the one company. There are a lot of companies I'm inspired by. Blueprint for Yova. So I'm, I'm inspired, for example, I am inspired in Switzerland. There's the Alternative Bank Schweiz, um, which I think, I mean, they're definitely pioneers um, in, in what they're doing. I mean, they started doing sustainable finance when it like was even for another 20 years, it wasn't a thing. And they're still very strict and they have these awesome ways of, you know, thinking about people. So if you're there, I think, Every five years you're in the company, you get a paid leave of, is it one or two or three months? But just the way you know that in the culture, they have this rule that the highest paid person uh, can only make five times the money that the, the lowest paid person in the company does. So I, I just have a tremendous admiration for the way that they think about themselves and like the, the way they structure the company. So I'm, I'm inspired by them. I'm also inspired by companies like Patagonia, just you know where, where you know the, the purpose of the company there is a very clear purpose and it's not shareholder value. It's actually, you know, creating a product that people love. In that case, you know, it's, it's outdoor um, equipment and, and apparel, but doing that in a way that, you know, is wholesome for everybody involved. So I'm, that's, that's what I'm inspired by. I'm also inspired by companies like Tesla, which, you know, solve sustainability problems, not by telling people, you know, you should really get off uh, the internal combustion engine, but by simply building a cooler product and like making everybody want that instead. Um, so I have these, these role model companies and I have many mentors. Um, so I would say at least once, once a week, I talk to a person that I consider a mentor and those are you know, former bosses of mine, as well as, um, younger colleagues that, that, that I've worked with in the past, but that, you know, inspire me in some way. I have many mentors. Cool. Now I'm going to ask you some, what we call the rapid, the rapid fire questions. So it's really just uh, for you to throw out the first thing that comes to mind. And, uh, and there's two more questions from Samuel and Yasmin, but let's take them uh, in the follow-up to NA uh, and, and networking, so we can end on time at least this, uh, this section. So, human, what personal belonging do you own that you would never sell? My vinyl collection. What is your, uh, your most unusual skill? <laughs> I'm very good at pouring beer into glasses, so it has exactly the right amount of foam. <laughs> What's more important, strength, speed, or stamina? Stamina. What historical figure do you admire the most? Edward Snowden. Sorry? Edward Snowden. What is your favorite season? Winter. When was the last time you tried something new? Yesterday. Can you tell us what it is? 
Yes, I tried out a new tool. Um, so we're, we, ha we have a lot of job postings that we're posting right now. And one of the things that we're always trying to make sure is that, you know, they also appeal to women. We have, we know we have a lot of unconscious biases. And so we're experimenting a lot with tools that, you know, take out the male wording out of the job postings and, and these kind of stuff. So it, I tried some tools yesterday for that. Okay. I thought it would, it would be something kinkier. But... Team? <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Team or single founder? Team. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Beer or wine? Beer. What is your favorite app? My favorite app? Sorry, can I briefly check my apps? I mean, I would say email, but I think that would disappoint you now too. So let, let me go for something funner. Besides the Yoga app. Okay, besides the Yoga app. Okay, that also would have been a good... Uh, um, a good uh, answer. So two apps I really like right now. One is, one is White Risk. It's it's a it's a ski touring app that tells you know about avalanche risk and helps you plan ski tours. I like Winter, so um, I really like that. Another app that I use a lot right now uh, is called Love While Parenting. It's daily tips, you know, for one of the many struggles uh, every day that you have with with being a parent and remaining sane and happy. One thing on your bucket list. Um, calming down. If you could choose one attribute from any animal, what would you like to have? Oh, good question. I'm not sure if that's an attribute, but I am. I would love to be able to fly for sure. Cool. Thank you, Tillman. That, that was the last question. Okay. We open, uh, the, um, the scene again to everyone. Uh, I think I need someone's help now to make everybody show up again. Um, and thank you, Tillman. It was uh, really insightful and, and I think interesting for all of us. And for me, definitely, it was uh, uh, very inspiring. Thank you. My pleasure.